now I will let you be. Persiana, do you have any questions before I? Uh, no, okay. I, I think I got this. Otherwise, okay. I'll wait when you come back and uh, ask. I'm sure you have it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's go into. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Rohan, and I'm going to be presenting my semester and project to you today. Um, the focus of my project was based off of uh, Puccini's uh, opera Turandot, and it's one of my favorite operas. And uh, I imagine that this research space would be used for the purpose of kind of studying vocal pedagogy and um, music and opera more specifically. And um, the essential concept behind my design is that music is like a, a very rhythmic pattern, and more specifically, this opera and I guess this aria non piangere lu is like a very um, undulating rhythmic landscape throughout the whole piece in and of itself. And there's a constant ascension or dissension throughout the whole piece, but interspersed within each of those ascensions and dissensions is miniature versions of each of them. And the way that I've manifested that in a physical form is by starting um, kind of much lower with a baseline and a base point and having an apex that comes up and around to the point of the circulation here. So circulation is the architectural manifestation of this idea. Um, and this specific aria known Piangere Lu is kind of like a microcosmic exemplification of this ideological concept as a whole within the context of the entire opera, which kind of has that same idea and the research space at hand. So let's go. So these are uh, some of my drawings. So I have two plans and two sections here. Um, the plan on the top left was cut uh, kind of more at this level. So kind of at the kind of lower floor and this one subsequently at an upper level, so over here. Um, and I guess the basic idea you can see behind it is that the fact that there's a circulation that goes all the way from the pit and comes up and around, and I didn't draw it all the way around here, but it comes up and around this way, you can see it at this point as well. And the space is more or less a series of walls that have voids in between them. And each of those voids is then separated further by um, different levels existing. So there's never really a floor if you will, there's kind of more or less a first and a second floor just for practical purposes of organizing space. But each program, uh, each programmatic element is technically kind of separated by, you know, a six inch or a foot um, difference in height throughout the whole structure. And so here is the, um, the longer side. This is the sections, the two sections of the model. And there's that uh, circulation pathway that you can see that goes up here. And um, Here's, you know, there's a research space on this side over here. Oh, I think, I guess I can't zoom into it on this thing, Never mind. But uh, then the circulation continues up and around. And even here, you can see that there's one level here, another level here, and then it goes up and there's another level here. And there's further delineation of this space on this side. And even on this side, there's a seated research space over here. There's a standing research space over here. It's another seated research space over there. So this gives the researcher plenty of options of places to actually be and exist, but the whole point of studying music and especially opera and vocal pedagogy is to be able to sing and have a very sonorous environment. Um, so that's kind of what this larger void at the top is. So it really has a primary example of what the purpose of the space is for. And this is just the model as a whole. This is the longer side elevation. And one of the things that I struggled with with this model was I was looking at kind of how massive um, everybody else's was feeling because I was in studio and I was kind of looking at everybody else's models that was there. And I wanted the sense of the circulation as part of the, the structure of itself and not necessarily just something that was outside the structure because it is entirely outside the primary, uh, primary volume. So I decided to put this ring over here and it still allows plenty of transparency to make it feel as if it's still outside, but there's something about that frame existing that still pulls it into the larger um, context of the space at hand. Uh, this is the short elevation and the back side. And then these are just um, the front, the back, the left, the right, and a perspective as well as the top view of it. And I guess I just had some last kind of detail shots of the circulation that I wanted to show and kind of how there's those levels yet again that I was talking about over here and where they are. Um, and yet again, the circulation as a whole and how it's kind of this journey all the way from the bottom to the top. But yeah.
Well, uh, thank you, Rohan. How do you, how do I pronounce your name? Yeah, it's correct, it's Rohan. Okay, well, thank you, Rohan. Um, okay, so I have a, a few comments, uh, but maybe I'll start uh, with a question to you, which is, um, you know, after going through this process, right? Um, I mean, you have like a particular take on what you define as research, right? Like maybe I'm not so familiar with, you know, uh, research as it operates in the in the realm of opera, right? <laughs> um, so I'm just curious to know what your notion of research is, and in what ways do you think that you know research can happen uh, within your building, right, or between um, between the spaces that you have created for that? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I guess as a whole, generally speaking, my notion of research is kind of uh, there's an aspect of it that is comes from an external stimulus. So studying texts, reading papers, um, becoming more educated about a subject that you're interested in learning. And then there's another part of it, which is very introspective and contemplative, which has to be the processing of that kind of external research into your own thoughts and opinions. And I guess a further example of that within the context of music or opera is actually practicing it and making it into something that does exist. So it's not so much, you know, writing a paper about, you know, what the inner meanings of Puccini's mind were when he was writing an opera, but it's, you know, what is it like to sing the opera and feel the aria and feel the rhythm and feel the movement of it? And um, I think that my manifestation of that can kind of be shown in the fact that I have like some more practical spaces for research, such as like seated and standing research spaces. And then there's this very abstract kind of void of a space at the top that I imagine that like this would have been shelving on this side. I didn't want to sit and make a bunch of little shelves because I thought that would detail that would take away from the concept. Um, but you know, there'd be shelving and stuff here, so you'd have plenty of space to store music and store books and store research. But at the same time, you have this massive, you know, space with tons of volume to be able to sing and kind of hear yourself in like a very resonant space. Yeah, I just have to say that, you know, ba based on what you said and based uh, on what I've seen of the project, right, uh, there is definitely um, a way of conceiving research, something that it's reactive to the spaces in which uh, the person is conducting such a research, right, rather than just be, uh, rather than the architecture becoming, let's say, like a passive receptacle for, uh, um, for any exchange of knowledge, right. Uh, which is what is supposed to happen when, when one conducts research, right? So if, let's say, um, if you're, um, let's say if research is a reactive force uh, within uh, the building, I, I wonder in what ways, right? Like if you were to uh, uh, go back a few steps, right? Um, in what ways would you further instrumentalize the spaces that you have created, right? To create more reactions, right? Uh, and therefore, those reactions will generate a series of responses that might generate into, you know, new uh, vocal uh, ranges, right? Or new, um, I don't know, tonalities, uh, whatever it, it might be, right? That condenses and produces new ways of producing music or in your case, like uh, uh, writing or um, discovering uh, the magnitude of, of a certain opera, right? So, um, so my question to you, right, is like, you know, now that you have gone through a process of making, um, how do you go about a process of deconstructing your own work, right? And curating those reactive spaces in order to generate specific reactions, right? Um, and I think like you have them uh, in, in certain instances, uh, but I wonder if they are, you know, autonomous enough or distinctive enough, right? to be read as, you know, one condition versus another, right? You have in, in that, you know, first level condition, like a series of very compressed spaces, but because all of them are similar in proportion, right? They might generate the same reaction, therefore the same effect, right? But of course, you know, you're dealing with the world of human subjectivity, right? You might experience that same space in a very different way as I do, right? Um, but I think that, you know, what is interesting about this sort of, uh, of assignments is recognizing the role of architects to curate as many experiences of, as possible, right? And give the possibility of choice, right? And therefore, you know, um, having 
uh, dissimilar conditions at several intervals is a way of curating that experience, right? And curating that, uh, you know, um, appearance of choice, right? Even though you're still curating the circulation, you go through this space first, then you go here, then you go there, right? In what ways can you also provide a platform in which the user might, you know, uh, reconfigure based on, you know, their own individual subjective experience, right? Um, so, so that being said, like, you know, uh, my question to you, or like, as you move forward in, you know, your education uh, would be, you know, to, to pay a lot of attention on that, right? Like, in what ways um, do you um, create uh, distinct reactions and make them actually distinct from one another, right? Um, because then the entire uh, first floor seems to me, uh, seems to be a, a very, let's say, similar condition throughout, right? We just have to go to the second floor to find a, a, a different condition, right? And there's never a right or wrong, right? Um, I'm just here to provoke, you know, like a, 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 a way of thinking that might be distinct to yours, right? Um, so that's why, you know, if there, uh, if there is a series of compressed narrow spaces on the first floor, right? How does room one is distinct from room two, et cetera, right? Uh, maybe it is, uh, it is an analysis of acoustic conditions in your case, right? Oh, or maybe for someone else's, uh, it might have been light, right? Um, uh, or for others, just the circulation of, uh, of air, right? So there are many ways of deconstructing what you have done, uh, but I think like there's a lot to it that, that I find fascinating, right? Especially when it comes to, you know, um, to music, because, you know, I, I would have read your project completely differently <laughs> if you haven't told me that it was about, you know, this precise opera. Uh, I thought uh, it looked like a beautiful, like industrial relic, right? Like from, you know, the uh, beginning or the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, right? Because it seems like almost like I don't know, like a coal factory or something, but uh, but in a good way. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Hila and Bern Becker, or a series of German photographers uh, that took pictures of this, you know, industrial monument and in a very particular way. And if you look at the pictures, you will know why this resembled that. But anyways, just to go back to the project, uh, you know, I. I ask you as you move forward, right? Like in what ways uh, arch uh, architecture is able to, you know, provoke reactions, right? And in what times is architecture reactive to the program or to a certain condition and when it is the cause of a reaction, right? So in this particular example in your work, it is, you know, very, um, it's very obvious that you're, you know, seeking for a reaction, right? I would say that, uh, an important tool for you. And if you wanna continue investigating how architecture can produce emotion and exalt certain you know, experiential conditions, uh, I would research more on stairs, right? Like there seems to be like, let's say like a, um, uh, like a common thread in most of the spaces, right? Like the step down or the stepping up or, you know, the stair itself as you know a mechanism to produce not just movement but also um, the possibility of um, how to say this uh, of accelerating and decreasing right uh, the the presence of someone in a space right but if you were to conduct even more research about different type of stairs right and the different uh, let's say elements that make a stair a stair right you could even be more in control of you know moments in which a stair is able to completely accelerate movement, right? By reducing the, um, the run and augment and, you know, also decreasing the rise, right? Or augmenting both and creating, you know, like a, or an almost dissatisfying um, process of going upwards, right? Or downwards. Um, so anyway, so these are comments that hopefully, you know, will help you as you move forward and reflect on your own work, right? Um, just as a final comment or maybe a question, right? Like um, now that you have gone through this process, um, what is your take on your work, right? Like it is interesting that um, you have talked about uh, monumentality or, or a, a, an idea of massiveness, right? But that little by little gets uh, turned away. So I'm just curious to you know, like also in what ways do you think that 
you know relates to research relates to knowledge or relates in your case with um with the opera that you're referencing yeah um we are actually at time but just give a quick response um okay <laughs> sorry if you want to give a quick um response. No, but I, going off of what you said actually about kind of talking about acoustics and stuff like that in, in, in context of the question, I was looking initially at having like this very curvilinear form, but it's kind of hard to do curves when everything, like we had to do everything orthogonally. So I had this very complex series of steps that turned into like this thing and it looked like a forte and I had all of that. Um, but it had this kind of very interesting notion of that of the stairs changing, if you will, because it would start very shallow and it would end up rising. So I would probably end up going and trying to explore something more like that just to see and maybe come back to a little bit more of my original concept in the, you know, just ideation process and maybe see if I can find like a, a fun balance between them. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Rohan. Thank you. Awesome. Ready. Um, I believe I am next. Uh, let me share my screen. Alrighty, can you all see it? Yes. Yes, okay, awesome. Um, so here is uh, my project. Uh, I did my project uh, based on Franz Kafka's uh, Metamorphosis, which is a story he wrote in the uh, early 20th century. And it has a central theme of existentialism. Um, so the area of research I was really trying to uh, focus on in my building was literature and philosophy because um, the story is a piece of literature, but this uh, story is really about a life philosophy and how we choose to live our lives. Um, existentialism is the study of trying to understand human nature and what our purpose is. And um, my goal was to limit distraction um, for the researcher uh, through a restrained design. Um, and this first view right here is a um, view from the southeast corner of the building. Um, and I have a couple of scale figures right here. Um, so moving forward. Um, so here are my drawings. Uh, the north area, this north side is right here. Um, and the all of the cardinal directions. And then uh, this is a roof plan. So from the top of the building, uh, this is a section cut right underneath uh, the second floor, uh, the second floor of my building. Um, and then these are section cuts. This one is looking uh, to the north, and then this one is looking to the south. Um, and one first thing that I want to mention is that my building is eight feet above the ground, um, which is close enough to the ground to be connected to the earth, um, but it's just high enough to show a disconnect from uh, life. And uh, this is kind of a reflection of the existentialist mindset. Um, so here are my two section cuts. Uh, this first one is looking west. Um, here we can see uh, we, I have three different layers of my building, so three different uh, floors essentially. Um, this first floor is essentially a um, living quarters for the researcher. Um, this uh, little area right here, it's actually a, a volume um, for sleeping. So that is where the researcher does its sleeping. Um, and right here we have a window, um, which is on the north uh, side of the building. So that uh, sunlight reaches into uh, the area when it's time for the researcher to uh, awaken. And then we have a uh, desk right here, right next to the um, sleeping area, um, because I found, this is from more of a personal experience, but the time period between when I am going to bed and uh, when I get in my bed and when I actually fall asleep is some of my most valuable thinking time. So I incorporated a desk right there um, in order to uh, you know, quickly get those ideas out and then, you know, hop right back into your bed. But, um, and then on, uh, this is the second layer, the second story. And right here we have a standing research area with a window for lots of natural light and then a book storage area right here. Um, and then on the top is what I refer to as the reading room um, with lots of natural light and um, a desk is also in there. And then on the left side, we, uh, on the right side, we have the section looking uh, east and uh, the top right here is what I refer to as the dark room. And that is an area for reflection, um, more for philosophy um, without any windows or any distractions. So the user can go within there and uh, you know, not be distracted by any light or 
um, sounds. So they can go in there just uh, in that room is solely for thinking. Um, and then we have um, a personal uh, storage area right here um, on this living uh, area uh, level. And at the top here, we, we have a couple windows right here. Um, and then here's the outdoor walkway. And then here are the stairs down to the um, site. And then right here is the uh, west facade. There's plenty of windows to let in lots of natural light. Um, and there's various depths of um, the volumes of the um, building. And then right here is the northwest corner. Here's the dark room again. Um, and uh, I wanted to incorporate an air, uh, a uh, philosophical thinking of, you know, expanding knowledge. Um, you start at the bottom and you go to the top and these uh, rectangle, rectangles um, are uh, trying to communicate that. So they go from smaller to larger and it kind of just shows an ascension of thought. Um, and then moving forward, we have the, um, this is the south facade. Um, and I wanted to incorporate this idea of two different doors. The existentialists, it's um, kind of making, it's kind of about making life choices and your life choices uh, are where they lead you. And I wanted to incorporate the area, this idea of two different doors. Um, this first different door goes to uh, the living area. And then at the top, you can move on to the uh, areas to do work. So the two doors was kind of a central idea of my uh, entire design. And then uh, here's the Northeast corner and it's attempt to communicate the nature of abstract thought through a variety of different um, sized shapes um, that all work together in a way, but they uh, remain separate and serve different functions and they all are at uh, different, different depths. Um, and then here is um, all of the different sides and kind of just a whole view of my building. And that is all I have, that I have for prepared. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Walker. Um, Walker, don't tell me something. What is the type of research that is conducted in, in your building? Uh, the type or of like is uh, yes. it's literature and philosophy, but mainly uh, the type of research that would be done is kind of reading and uh, looking through uh, texts, but also just I wanted to incorporate a philosophical kind of um, understanding of my building because literature uh, and existentialism is very philosophical. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wanted to incorporate both of those elements into my building. All right. Um, so I have a, a series of questions before uh, maybe starting with the comments. Um, I'm, I'm just curious uh, about, um, or maybe if you can elaborate a little bit more about the role of the ground or that excavated ground, excavated space that you have. Um, in what ways do you think um, yeah, how, how does that reinforce um, ideas of, you know, existence <laughs> broadly, uh, but, you know, for the kind of effects that then the building itself is able to produce for its users? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the site void where this is uh, essentially a kitchen, which we were asked to uh, put include in our building, um, but uh, this site void right here, um, I wanted to incorporate that uh, kind of as part of my building because the whole um, part of the building goes into the uh, void. And I wanted to use that because um, as existentialists and you know, just from a life standpoint, uh, we're all from the earth and we all come from the earth and that's where eventually we end up. And I wanted to communicate that um, since there's not a lot of natural light that really gets into that void, um, it's kind of dark. And I just wanted to use that as an area of reflection uh, for the users of the building. And I wanted to um, be able to give them a space uh, for thought, but also that was practical. I see. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I have a series of comments that uh, I hope, you know, uh, as you move on in, in similar vein, as I, I told your classmate, um, you know, in what ways you might be able to, um, you know, to move forward with the project, what, what would be things that um, could have been uh, considered, right, um, moving along. I mean, I, I find it interesting uh, that there is a specific place <laughs> to do something within your building, right, like, and, and that thing would be thinking, right, um, and, uh, and, and I would say that, you know, I would challenge that, right, I, I would challenge that the sort of, you know, uh, 
um, physiological tradition of assigning functions uh, to particular spaces and particular uh, moments within someone's experience of the world or everyday life, right? Um, you know, uh, another philosopher, Walter Benjamin, says that actually we experience the world through distraction, right? And like the, the best ideas, let's say, might come from, from that distracted way. So, um, I, and I don't know if, if this has happened to you, but, uh, you know, as someone who might enter a PhD program, right, and facing a lot of ex existential crisis. Do I really want to commit to this for the next seven years of my life? I can totally agree with, with the sort of, you know, spatial requirements of having spaces for concentrating, right? But I also do appreciate or would appreciate moments in which I could get distracted from my own work, right? Or get distracted from, you know, uh, the necessity to be constantly producing, right? To be constantly, let's say, uh, fabricating content for, uh, you know, my supposed research is, right? Um, and that's why I was curious about the treatment of the ground, right? Because maybe, you know, uh, the fact that you're detaching the ground and that, you know, subterranean kind of uh, kitchen area from, from the top uh, and, you know, actually pairing it with the most, you know, carnal of, uh, of the senses, right? Like eating with taste, et cetera. Um, I thought it was interesting that that maybe everything that is touching the ground is more associated with that functionalist um, uh, view that has to do with how we maintain and preserve our bodies, but also the sort of things that we do in distraction, right? And then the sort of separation that might happen on the top in which it is concentrated, focused work, right? Uh, but at the same time, like I, I wonder if, you could use the circulation, right? Like the, the set of sta uh, steps as something that, you know, um, um, the threats between both functions, right? The ones that happen in distraction and the ones that need to be focused. And that maybe in that pathway, we might get lost, right? We might constantly be choosing which one, uh, which state we wanna be in, the focus or the detached um, as a means of, you know, uh, instrumentalizing, you know, the tools that you're deploying within uh, your project, right? So for example, and again, like, maybe this is too similar to um, uh, my comment through Rohan, but I, I still feel like, you know, the stare and, and the use of the stare to accomplish some of your predicaments, I, I would encourage for you to revise it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but again, I, I, I also in a similar vein, right? Like I can read something because I am a, a, a person distinct from you, right? And, and of course, like I might be, you know, trying to force my own uh, concept or my own way of, ex or my own experiences into your project. But, but I would say that um, uh, th there are interesting then aspects within the project itself, right? That don't need uh, to, to be revised. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think like one of those is actually the, the sort of, even in this image that we're still seeing, right? Like it is almost like a detachment, like two conditions that are opposite to one another, right? Like mm -hmm. there are these two uh, at the left, these two levels that are almost similar uh, in proportions, right? But then uh, to the right, we have like this uh, uh, double height almost uh, space, right? And the fact that they're together in the center, right? even though they're distinct, they're united, but they give the possibility uh, of that duality that you mentioned at the beginning, right? So I think like that is super well accomplished. I also enjoyed like the, the two doors, like why not, right? And the possibility of constantly, you know, providing or provoking a, a choice, right? But, um, but I wonder if, you know, that nuance uh, in, in the sort of uh, choices you give us is also manifested between, you know, the realms of, you know, focused activity and distracted ones. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Walker, for the presentation. Thank you for your commentary. It was very, very insightful. All right. Well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Is Are we at time or how are we doing on time? OK. Yeah, it just ended. OK, awesome. Um, OK, I think I'm next. So I'll be sharing my screen. And 
Oh, oops, sorry. So, um, hi, I'm Dallas, and um, I'm focusing on an artist, a German artist named Kath Kollwitz, sorry. And then um, she's mainly focusing on mourning and expressionism, which um, the design is based on the response to widespread anxiety about humanity's increasingly um, discordant relationship with the world. And moreover, um, based on the working class and the social criticism in Germany during the 1980s, the space is designed to be more like compressed while having a large contrast with the open space connected to the outer world. And this is just a um, like a close shot of a working space with next to an entrance. And this is my drawings. This is the first floor where um, just to show like, oh, the, um, where at the top is always the north. So, um, yeah, so, sorry, I'm kind of nervous. And um, that's the second floor where as you move up to um, the second floor, there's more open space. Uh, my goal, my goal is to um, focus on the experience of um, while the researchers are in the building. As you move up to the floors, um, there will be more open space compared to those um, more compressed and um, private areas. And that's my void space where um, they will move down from the stairs and, and do their cooking there. And this is my um, section model which um, my drawings is to help a better uh, reading of the model. Um, within my section model, you can tell that um, I create um, a space where they can store the books. And I specifically focus on where, like the coordinate directions where the sun sets. And I did a little research on like storing of the books which um, books are not supposed to be exposed to too much sunlight. So that's the only room um, I didn't have windows in. And I designed this for like multiple researchers instead of just one. So I created um, more than two, just about two, three or four um, standing or sitting research areas. And I specifically designed it like make it like a semi-private or public um, working area to mimic the working class situation where people are in a compact um, compact um, area and then constantly have to um, create like enforcing like social con like social interactions. Um, so there'll be a lot of people moving um, up and down in the building. And that's the... Um, the front view of it, um, which as you move up, you can tell that there's more um, like space that you can have interaction with the nature or like this more with more sunlight. And then the top is like mostly exposed to the exterior world. And that's the um, side that facing the cliff where um, it's the west, west side that where you store the books, which there's no windows. But then um, above, there's mainly open space to um, to fix the problem of having enough sunlight so people could just move up to, this, to the third floor. And these are my um, other side photos. That's the front side and the back side. And then the top view where you can see it's mo mostly um, exposed to the outside and um, two working areas with windows or fenestrations. And my um, isometric view. And I also um, included um, detail shots of how people could utilize the space where um, 
with the sitting um, research area and um, the, the little library or uh, where people store the books. And um, the only room that's not compressed is the room on the top where um, you can find as you move up just like social class that you can feel the um, relaxation or um, the relief as you move up to um, a higher hierarchy or like a social class, I mean. And I think that's it. Yeah. All right. Well, first of all, hi, Dallas. Don't be I'm, nervous. Sorry. I know that the final reviews are always awkward, <laughs> awkward and, and, and weird, but you know, like we're just here to talk about architecture and enjoy it. Yes. <laughs> so uh, don't worry. Um, I mean, I, I have to say that um, I, I would have preferred, um, you know, like uh, in, in your presentation, and I say this because, you know, probably, um, uh, probably I wouldn't reinforce uh, concepts such as, you know, um, social class and social class distinction or, you know, reinforce or uh, further promote um, divisions between society, right, as a means of organizing spaces, right. And therefore, I would have preferred if, you know, ideas regarding mourning, mm -hmm. or, yeah, uh, were, you know, further enhanced and used. Um, as uh, as the means by which you would describe your project, right? And I know that you know uh, mourning and expressionism, you know, are tied in in the work of, um, of of the artist that you presented at the beginning. I forgot her name, um, but um, in a way, I, I would have loved to you know hear more about that, right? Like because I I would say that what is interesting about the concept of mourning is that. Um, that, that it's something that, that we don't tend to think so much, right? Uh, it's something that, you know, uh, according to our experiences in life and in the ways in which it presents itself in, in, in our experiences in the world, right? Uh, are related to, you know, just death, right? Uh, of a particular um, person or, you know, um, or object or, you know, pet or whatever, right? But we don't think of mourning as, a, as an aspect of life, right? You might be mourning, you know, the changing of seasons, right? You might be mourning, uh, you know, uh, uh, the fact that, I don't know, a star in the galaxy just died, right? Like there are many ways in which mourning can be materialized or, or uh, paid a, uh, to pay attention uh, to, right? Uh, when, when we're talking about something that, that is essential to, to human activity, right? Um, so, uh, and, and, and if I read your project through that lens, right, then I'm fascinated by it, right? Because then there are, um, there are spaces in which I'm allowed to do this activity, right? You know, um, on my own, right? The compressed spaces that are for a single person um, habitation, right? Uh, but then, you know, there are moments in which there is a collective um, space where we can all do it together, right? We can just uh, join like a morning club and you know we're there just to, to hear about, you know, the process of, of loss, right? And to understand that and to understanding what ways that could be productive for um, the sort of research or the, the sort of, you know, um, knowledge that, that can be, that these people might be generating, right? Um, and I think like that is a, a very essential and, and interesting aspect of, you know, also how, how the project deals with its own aesthetic manifestation, right? Um, you know, when we were looking at your facades, whether it is intentional or not, right? Like I, I imagine that the facades just um, became uh, a process that derived from the interior organization. It wasn't something that you just, okay, this is the facade, I'm gonna design it, right? Am I correct? Yeah. So. The facade as a as an expression of a pure interiority, yeah, they become super interesting, right? They're actually the most expressive of uh, of your uh, of the images that we've seen, right? And what is interesting is that accumulation of processes within the building, right? But again, uh, as I've mentioned with your previous classmates, and 
maybe for all of you uh, as you move on uh, with your education, right? Um, is to, well, now that you have, the, uh, now that the, the phase of designing and making has finished, right? Th this is the moment for reflecting on the work to understand and to learn from what you have done, right? And I would say that, you know, if then, you know, um, the facade is the expression of the interior, in what ways would you revise the interior, right? Uh, to start constructing a facade, right? Like a presence of your building as an exterior condition, right? Um, and then, you know, if, if let's say, if you don't want your, your, your architecture and uh, the ide ideological presence of your, of your building as a reinforcement of unequal power structures, right? In what ways can you challenge or use your project, right? to challenge those dynamics, right? And I think like you did in a, in, in a way when, when you're saying, well, in this floor, we're all collectively engaging in discourse. We're all collectively engaging in, you know, in research and in, you know, in what we do as researchers, right? Uh, so I think like that is a good uh, way of subverting that narrative, right? And, and, so, and subverting those um, instruments of power within your own building, right? And, and, you know, this would lead me if you if you can go back to your plans, uh, if that's okay. Yeah, and for yeah, exactly. So, you know, one of the, the nicest thing is, you know, precisely that subversion of hierarchies is the fact that there are, there is almost like a, a free plan, right? There are no rooms, there's not assignation of ownership into uh, distinct spaces, right? Um, so, you know, that would be, uh, 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 again, like a, a different way of framing the project and, and trying to, you know, uh, materialize those, uh, those conditions. All right. Mm -hmm. um, then I would say, you know, you guys are, are super funny. I think like from the three projects we've seen, uh, it's just funny that um, always the excavated space is the tallest, right? But then you go to very normative um, uh, floor height um, heights. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, also a way of subverting that is to, and especially, for example, when we were talking about in, in Rohan's uh, project about, oh, how do you make distinct rooms, you know, completely distinct is also by probably playing with heights, right? Um, so in your case, for example, Dallas, it could have been interesting that the most social uh, and the most collective space in which, you know, uh, you are, are encouraging uh, social interaction if that could also be a taller space, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that you, we don't feel, let's say, oppressed by uh, the mass uh, of the building itself, right? Um, so, uh, so those are my comments. I think that, uh, again, like on the issue of the interiority of, uh, of the building, right? Like the organization and spatial arrangement of the interior spaces manifesting themselves as an exterior quality in the facade it's something that, um, you know, that I would encourage you to further explore, right? Um, to see that uh, one-to-oneness um, in that process. And in what ways, uh, you know, you're more deliberate or you have like a more conscious agency on what that process might become, right? Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, I, I, I mean, I think like all of the models we've seen today are, are gorgeous and also the drawings. Um, I was surprised actually when I saw the section of the model uh, to see that certain things were a little bit crooked, right? Mm -hmm. But I felt like that gave the project also like a life of its own. And so, you know, uh, in, in just as a, as a final comment, I know that we're running uh, uh, out of time, um, it would be, you know, to, to look now at the images, to look now at the process and actually learn uh, certain things, right? Like, uh, how expressive, you know, a crooked wall is, right? And, and how much it can say um, about the experiential qualities uh, of such a building or such a space, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the little things that you can start putting in a, in a bag and take with you to your next studio. Thank you. Um, Thank I just want to add a little more. Um, just the top side, the reason why it's more like, um, uh, spacious it's also because I thought of like morning with the skylight here with the light and then that uh, more of a private morning area rather than yeah. like a um 
like everyone in there. Like, situation. Yeah, no, exactly. That's why, you know, I appreciated that there were moments for doing that activity in solitary, right? And the spaces in which we can also do it, um, you know, collectively, which we don't think about it a lot, right? Like, I've never experienced this in my life outside of my family in which I just get around a few of my friends and we just cried, you know, our <laughs> our hearts out just because we're sad, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, but so I appreciate that, like the, the possibility of having such a space. Okay. Thank you, Dallas. Is it time? Yeah, we ran out of time, like two minutes oh, ago. Sorry. You guys had a good commentary. <laughs> Okay, I'm next. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can everyone see? Yeah, okay. Oh, I can't full screen it. Is this okay? There's not like a full screen bar. Uh, I think if you um, click... Oh. Um, Command L, you might go to full screen. Oh, but you, you're looking at it in um, box. Yeah, it's fine. No worries. Okay, sounds good. Well, my name is Maylee, um, and I focused my design on James Joyce's um, con stream of consciousness, which is um, like a literary device in which like you write exactly what you're thinking. It's very raw, very fluid. It's just like exactly how your thoughts would come out. Um, so the way that I interpreted this in my design is I tried to make um, kind of like one long corridor and it would come like this is the doorway right here, just like straight up here through the stairs and then kind of up and then up the second level as well to try to just make like one long thought like as I envisioned it and then along the way there's like different like smaller thoughts like steady areas little nooks little tables. And then what I wanted to demonstrate with this photo is like the different ceiling heights that I tried to create. Like this man in the back here is more of a, like a solitary space where you can look outside and it's a, it's a six foot ceiling right there. So you can just barely fit one person in. And then um, this lady right here is more in like a common space that I try to create, like more of just a gathering or just space for multiple people. Um, and then this is my plants and sections. Um, I just, this is, I, I put these in wrong. So the bottom is actually the north. Um, and I guess I just wanted to talk about the, the cooking area right here. Um, I put it right under the building to try to make kind of a cohesive element. So it's not separated from everything else. And then the staircase comes out from the building and then down. So it's all connected. And then this is my sectional area. You can see the pit as well. And then this continual staircase. And then here on this little balcony area is like a group collaboration area. So there's a table there and um, a bunch of researchers can talk about their work. And then these two little nook here are nooks here are standing research areas for the researchers living there. And then this is the bed. So this is more of just like a solitary area. I have a smaller, a shorter ceiling right there in the back. Um, and then this is the north face. Um, you can kind of see more of the jetting shape that I wanted to create on the exterior. One of my goals was to create a more simple, simplistic interior to allow for a clearer state of mind because um, the, the stream of consciousness is more mental than anything else. So I tried to create like a very clear mindset on the inside when you're doing your research. And then on the outside, there's more of a jetting shape to um, encourage creativity. So I tried to make these um, desks, the research desks facing outwards towards the landscape. So you have more inspiration to look at, but then the interior is simplistic. So you just kind of have like an inspiration yet you have a clear mind to go off of. And then this is the east. And then here again is that group collaboration balcony. And then the balcony on top is more of a solitary thing. Um, it connects to the bedroom. So there's a desk right here. And then just this space to just kind of like decompress, I kind of thought, and just view the, um, the outside over this cliff right here. And then these are just um, the faces of the building. I have the west, the east, the top, and then this is the north, and then the south. And then 
this isometric picture right here I wanted to include because it really emphasizes the jetting that I was trying to create on the exterior of the building. You can just kind of see it better when it's at an angle rather than like face by face. So um, yeah, I believe that's all I have. All right, well, thank you, Maylee. I mean, I, I just like this uh, picture of the model uh, on the right. Um, well, on the corner here to the right uh, underneath the plan view. Um, I, because I, I like the possibility of having two entrances, right? Um, as a way of, uh, you know, enhancing, uh, well, your idea of how you can make a building that facilitates sort of stream of consciousness, right? Um, but, but then, you know, if we were to amplify that concept, like I'm just very, very much interested in, in understanding how you, how you use that concept, right? And, and in what ways you deploy that concept in, in very specific design moves. So I wonder if you could go back a little bit and, and you know, point at those um, precise design moves. Yeah. Um, let me find it. Okay, so this is the first floor plan, and this is the like the main entrance that you see. And I just wanted to create like mainly like a main path through here, just like a straight path. You can even go around here as well. But I wanted to use this like little wall barricade to kind of break up the space, so it'd be more of like a hallway rather than a gathering space to create that like more like fluid movement rather than like a like a stationary space. So you go up the stairs, and then this is the second staircase that takes you up and around. And then you would come out right here on this is the top floor. And then you could just go straight this way. So I wanted to create more of like a path rather than like rooms that you would stay in. Mm -hmm. So then like along the path, I guess, like are like this desk, this desk, this group space right here. And then like along the path as well, you can go down these stairs. Okay, I see, I see. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I like, um, well, I, I love that one-to-oneness in, in most of the projects, right? Like in what ways you're, you're using architecture to emphasize, you know, your own beliefs and in what ways um, uh, those beliefs are represented through, through architectural objects, or in this case, you know, your building. Um, and, and, I, and I think like in your case, it, it is quite successful uh, how, you know, um, that idea of the stream of consciousness results in, in a sort of pathway rather than just a corridor, right? Uh, which I think it's a, it's very interesting. But, but, but I wonder if you know, uh, the the reason why I had to ask is because I I saw that this first floor plan and I thought it was a, a very interesting because it was able to create like a sort of field condition of. Know, distinct objects creating the possibility of rooms being read within that um, space. Uh, but then, you know, once we go to the second floor, then things become too prescriptive, right? I think like the, uh, let's say like the non-prescriptive nature of, of the first floor gets somehow lost or, or, or diluted in the, in the fact that you're now on the second floor, now that you have, you know, a, a core, Right, like where you're um, having your staircases, and you know having to keep them fixed, right? Um, so, um, you know, if if there is a comment that I, I would encourage you to, you know, revise or you know to take into consideration as you move forward, is you know, in, in what ways can the second floor be more like the first floor, right? Like a series of objects that merely indicate the presence of a room, right? or that merely propose uh, the existence of a, of a space of inhabitation, right? And, you know, if, if you think about the stairs as being those fixed elements, you know, in a similar way as, you know, that column in the center of the first floor is doing, right? You can also start to think about it as, oh, you know, that is already the, the biggest uh, limiting condition, but then in what ways do I break the limitations or the boundaries on the other walls, right? Or how do I accommodate uh, this, let's say almost 
um, ephemeral condition of rooms not being completely or entirely rooms, right? I know that there were like spatial requirements given by the brief, right? Like, okay, a room here, a room there, but you know, in, in a way you are, um, you know, the absolute creator of this. You can say what for you is a room and what is not, right? We can, you know, we can, we could have just said that, okay, this first floor at night is the room for sleeping, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and that would have been fine for me, right? Um, so, you know, take a, a little bit more of, you know, uh, the, uh, the audacity to challenge also maybe uh, those conceptions, right? Um, and especially because you have such a strong concept, right? Uh, the, 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 the stream of consciousness as something that could be, you know, uh, constructive, but also destructive, that could be, you know, uh, uh, passive, but can also be extremely active, right? As something that it's constantly renewing uh, previous conceptions or ideas, right? Um, so I would say that, um, you know, that is something that I, I would like to encourage you uh, as you move forward, right? Um, and then can we go back then to the images of the model? Maybe the, yeah, number three, yeah. Yeah, I, I like how this looks, you know, uh, as, a, as an object though. Um, it does seem like a, a, it seems like a patchwork, right? If I were to, you know, ask Dallas to design your first floor and then you mainly design the second floor and we put it together, right? It, it would look something like this. So it is interesting how, you know, there are so many distinctive features um, to, to this facade over here, right? Like it seems like floor number one is almost, you know, taking over um, uh, floor number two and that we can read those sort of conditions. So again, I, I would say that as you move forward in your education, like try to consider that um, that, you know, that, that a whole is made out of parts, right? And how those parts are articulated to reveal that whole, um, it's always, you know, a marvelous, you know, a choreography of things to happen, right? And I think like here, it is very interesting how the fact that you had the stairs over here, your stairs are here, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're able to actually pierce through the second floor, right? And that that has a manifestation uh, on the exterior, right? So I wonder, like, um, you have also a similar condition over here. So I commend you on that, like that intuitive, you know, design uh, uh, strategies that you have deployed that allows us to read parts coming together to form a whole, right? Um, so, um, and then if you go uh, down to uh, some of your other images, yeah. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm still fascinated about this condition over here, right? Um, the, the, that possibility of going up again to a dissimilar path and maybe finding something different because I took a different path. It's also very much tied to that stream of consciousness, right? Um, so um, I would have loved that then in the interior condition, something similar could have happened, right? That you just don't have one set of staircase um, that is just there to access those spaces, uh, but is actually, again, like uh, creating the possibility of two pathways, right? That, uh, that because of their orientation, because of their location and situation within the project, right? Um, are able to produce completely radical experiences. So, well, that's it. Thank you so much, Mayday. Okay, thank you so much for your comment. Yeah, of course. I think we we have to move forward, right, uh, Rahan? So I guess that's me now. Um, here's mine. Uh, so my my scholarly retreat was for doctorate students studying Nicholas Copernicus and his various writings on. Um, on astronomy, especially solar astronomy, and the Earth's relationship to the sun. Um, I guess I can start with, with this is just a, uh, a picture of the, the support um, for the main volume and the pit here. And you can see this is the, over here is, is um, 
south. So this is the morning sun sort of casting these cutting shadows and especially engulfing the pit entirely in darkness, which was a choice. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, these are the drawings that I did. This is again, focusing on the pit because I didn't get very many good pictures of it. So I figured I would do a drawing. Um, you can see the supports and their, their relationships. This is the first floor and then two, two sections. Um, here it is in section. You can see that I maintained the initial volume um, almost to a fault, I'd say. I wanted to, I wanted it to be like monolithic, to be very like robust, I guess. And um, a few things I wanted to talk about on this page are uh, the, <laughs> the circulation uh, for the building. I said in my narrative that it was revolutionary, which was probably a poor choice of words. What I meant was that it revolves around a point not that it's something that's never been done before. It all revolves around like roughly here. And you can see these stairs here come up and then these, uh, and then over here um, is where there'd be an exception because I didn't want there to be, conceptually there'd be a ladder here or something, uh, a step ladder presumably. Um, and I didn't want it to be generated by stereotomic means because um, I wanted to divorce this space from, from every other part of the, uh, the design. And the same is true for the main volume and the, um, the surrounding ground. I didn't have uh, a long stair. I found that it compromised the whole point of, of elevating this 12 feet off the ground, having, having a long ramp or something at a, at a one to two slope really grounded it in, in a way that was not, um, it didn't help. Uh, what I was going for. So I, I decided to incorporate that into the design and make it kind of a choice. So to, to distinguish this sort of study space, these study spaces from, from both the cooking pit, pit and this, this viewing deck here, you would have to climb up these kind of, these um, on inconvenient ladders, I guess. And, and that takes a lot of effort, but so does work. So I wanted to, to sort of separate these spaces to distinguish work and and um, pleasure, I guess, and cooking. Um, not entirely. I did have this conceptually the sleeping area is right here uh, in the shadows. And, and the reason I did that, I think Walker said it earlier, and I completely agree that for me, sleeping and, and thinking are pretty much the same thing. So to separate those would do a disservice uh, in my mind. Um, but I can keep on going here. Um, here you can see one of the facades. This is the east, um, so it's going to be in the morning. And you can see these they're kind of this is uh, a head-on light. Um, all these extended plates that give um, convenient viewing, I guess, for the sun. Um, another thing that I I didn't do I talked about in my narrative avoiding conventional convenience, and part of that was not having. Usually you don't want these, these huge windows or in this case openings, I guess, fenestration on um, the, the east and west because it'll create a lot of glare and you're constantly looking at the sun. But I didn't think of that as necessarily a problem, like being aware of the sun, um, even if it's, it's slightly like, I don't know if it doesn't, if it's too, if it, it's, it's always going to be there in these spaces. And, um, and that was, I thought important for something like this, like being aware of the sun, not just being, not just knowing it's there, but being touching it and, and working around it. And the, the light in these spaces changes throughout the day. Um, this is another picture of the pit pretty much at the same time in the early morning. Um, and here you can see the cool shadows that are created and, and the light that, that works on the ramps and, and, the, shat and the, uh, <laughs> the darkness that's over here where you sleep. And over here where there's a, there's a little desk and um, uh, I guess there's nothing else to say there. And then these are my final, my final photos. Um, oh yeah, the pit. So the pit is, it's more accommodated to use um, at around noon or in the late afternoon um, and not so much the morning. And that's because going down and up again is is a, is a trial, is a task, as I already said. So to, to use it for all three meals would, would not be ideal. Hopefully you'd only be using it once and um, by having it sort of be blocked 
uh, from the sun by, by the stretch of most of the time in the morning and really only accommodating use uh, at a couple hours during the day I thought was, was befitting. And I think that's all I have to say. Um, well, thank you. How, how do I pronounce your name? It's Colin. Colin, okay. All yeah. right, well, thank you, Colin. I mean, I'm just, it is, I, it was, um, um, let's say, uh, a, a limitation for the studio, um, or, or, or was it, uh, it's actually the question, was it a limitation for all of you not to limit, let's say, uh, the sort of geometries that you could have used, right? Um, it all had to be orthogonal, um, I suppose. Okay. All right. Yeah. No, it's just, it, it's interesting, right? Uh, especially because while well, you're dealing with Copernicus and, you know, uh, ideas of, of radial um, conditions, right? That emanate from a center, but how to do that uh, with geometries that, um, that don't have an obvious center, right? I mean, um, for a rectangle, um, to, to know the center of a, of a rectangle, we would have to draw two diagonal lines, right? And then find the center by the intersection of those lines. But still, the, the sites uh, are not always, or the points on, on sites are not always at the same distance uh, to that center, right? So it's almost like a full center, right? It's not the same as the center of a, uh, of a sphere or the center of a, of a circle, right? Uh, but but it, so it is interesting, and and you know in this I, I commend you because in your investigation of you know an object that um, has a, a revolving um, strategy uh, towards a center that it's actually um, I mean I, I wonder and uh, maybe I missed this what do you have in the center but you know trying to avoid the center but to produce the sense of a centrality just by limiting um, the circulation or these balconies to the perimeter of, of, of the building was actually very well done, right? Um, so I commend you on that. I think like that is very, very successful um, because I can immediately understand the relationship between your conceptual ideas and their uh, materialization within the project, right? So I think like that is very interesting. Um, and then, you know, but. It, you know, leaving that concept aside, which of course, because you're dealing with Copernicus is, is an obvious one. I think like the, the most fascinating thing that you, you, you did for me was actually this idea of being aware of the sun, right? Um, to uh, uh, becoming aware of forces that are outside of human um, action, right? That are constantly affecting human action, right? Um, and, and I think like that is actually, you know, like a wonderful and, and incredible concept to further explore in your project, right? And, you know, a way of exploring that would be with the depth of your, of your walls, right? How much light is able to uh, penetrate and go in into the spaces, right? So for example, there are moments in which you're saying, you know, I want this, you know, darker space to be the bedroom and things like that. But then what are the tools that it, you can use to actually produce that, right? Um, maybe it's just uh, making the, the wall thicker or maybe, you know, the balcony's depth is actually bigger, right? So that then, you know, there's more uh, uh, shadow casted inside the interior space or, you know, certain shadows are more or less pronounced. So, you know, I, I would encourage you to look at the, uh, uh, the monastery by Le Corbusier in, in La Tourette, that is actually an exploration on that, in what ways, let's say, that um, presence and absence of light in the form in your case of, you know, uh, uh, being aware of the sun becomes actually uh, the, the, the compositional strategy for the depth of the rooms, right? The depth of the walls, of the windowsill, right? Um, of balconies, etc. So, you know, uh, I would, continue exploring that because I think it's a, it's a very interesting you know, spatial narrative that it's not just you know about about a concept that needs to be or needs to have like this one-to-oneness with how you're instrumentalized in architecture uh, but more with you know what are the sort of, of tools you have as a designer right and in what ways you can use them um, to produce very uh, determined conditions right 
And, and those things are actually, uh, they can be calculated, right? And, <laughs> yeah. you know, if, if you want to, you know, if this is a center for, you know, the study of, of I don't know, um, of physics, right? Uh, you can calculate those things, right? Because, you know, light is real, <laughs> right? And it travels through matter and, um, and et cetera. You, you can actually be very conscious and, and very uh, objective in the way in which you include light um, throughout the project, right? Um, so, sorry, just to um, go back to my question, what is at the center of your building? Um, still remains so, like an, an interesting question to me. Yeah. Originally, it had just been um, like a standing desk thing, but that felt too... I, I don't know. It felt too like defined, like and self-important for like what, what could just be anything. So structurally, there is nothing in the center. Mm -hmm. But um, I also had like a hole here, but it was it was useless. It didn't do anything. Um, so I I just I left it empty, which you could if you were kind of reaching. No, I into... like that it's empty, actually. Like, I like that it doesn't, you know, have a purpose, right? Uh, yeah. Its purpose um, exists just to have the circulation on the perimeter, and that's it, right? Um, and, and, and that would, you know, if, if you were to explain your project again, I would just say that, right? Like, that the center is just implied because it organizes a, a, a perimeter, and that's it. Um, so I, I like that. I, I like that, uh, you know, conceptual abstraction um, of something that, you know, doesn't exist and that's it. Next time. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Colin. Uh, I think we ran out of time, right? We just did, yeah. Okay. Woo. Okay, guys, we have to be uh, more efficient with this. <laughs> thank you so sure. much. I am up next, so I will start to share. Okay, so my name is Jeremy Bocanegra and this is my project and in this design, I wanted to, or we, we created a, a structure for an individual research, researching Plato's theory of forms and in this like theory, um, there's interesting ideas such as the um, preconception of ideas, which are then created into real life forms, so I wanted to um, go further with that idea and um, incorporate that in my design. So this is just a, um, a photo, like a perspective from the Northwest of the building. So here are some drawings, the top left being the plane or the plan at a elevation of eight feet above the ground. And um, some ideas that I liked about this um, elevation was that it showed off the movement of you start from the entrance with the long ramp and you progress through uh, all the way through the building to the end. And um, I just like that the, the contrast from stairs to platform and back to stairs um, really connects all the rooms in the building. And um, here on the right, we have um, the plan uh, at 16 feet. And so while it shows a lot of the similar aspects from the um, eight foot plan, it actually shows a lot more depth as to how tall the rooms are because the cut was like near the, the ceiling of these two rooms. And so it, I liked how much depth and space I had created with these rooms. And so here we have some section drawings as well and how you can occupy the space and this sitting area while well, you can also stand in it as well. It's almost, almost like, a, like a porch area. And here again, we have this, this um, uh, sketch or section where you can study over here and sit and uh, gaze uh, upon the south side of the of the site where the forest would be if you just wanted to look at some nature 
while you're studying. And here you also have this really cramped area where you could study as well if you wanted to in a more dark area where there isn't much light besides the doorway. And so here we have um, the section model and it kind of shows a lot of what was uh, shown in the drawings as well, how like there's a lot of movement from the ramp all the way up through the, through the stairs, through the hallways, these abstract hallways, and then back up into the main studying sitting area. And um, the main thing I wanted to show with these drawings was how you can translate um, forms and like add and subtract areas and how they relate to each other. And so here's a, a long elevation view and an isometric view of the front-ish area and the side. And here again, we see how there is this empty space within the building that is similar to this area as well in its dimensions. And we also have that each opening is um, created through protrusions with um, from these uh, protrusions. And uh, here we have some more pictures of the front, back, side, sides, um, the top, and isometric view, another one. And um, yeah, one more thing I would like to uh, discuss is how there is actually a ladder that you can see. Um, it is right here in this hole and how you are, you're almost separating yourself from this main concentration area where you study and you concentrate on your thoughts and philosophy. And then you move to this pit where you can relax and cook if you would like and at night you can even stargaze. And so um, that's really mostly what I have to say about it. All right, well, thank you, Jeremy. Um, I, just a remark for, for everyone. Um, I think that what is so nice and, and interesting um, about your model, Jeremy, is that because you used the same material for both uh, the, uh, the terrain and the building, it reads as the, the project emerges uh, from the ground itself, right? Um, and because again, like you're using a ramp um, to, to access uh, the building, um, it emerges from the ground as well, right? So uh, that is a, a very interesting, uh, you know, representational quality for what the model um, is, but also what you're doing within the project, right? Uh, you're saying that uh, there was a desire to somehow create the, the, uh, the appearance of spaces being excavated, but not just spaces, but pure forms, right? I, I, did I understand that correctly? Yes, correctly. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so I think like that is actually very, very interesting, especially in, the, in, in this um, uh, photo here uh, on the corner, right? Like we can see the, the, well, the prism being excavated from, uh, from the side, the one here on the top, the one here on the side, and probably this one, uh, not an excavation, but just like a, an extruded element that might be piercing through inside, right? That then is excavated uh, to create, let's say like that space uh, within, right? But then, you know, I'm not so convinced and I don't know like uh, if this is something that you might want to, um, as you move forward, also revise to think about the fenestration strategy as something that is also similar uh, to the process of creating an excavating space when you're using, you know, a stereotomic strategy um, for this, right? Sometimes, you know, the windows uh, don't seem to be part of, of that subtracted strategy, right? Like, uh, because for that, you would have, you know, the entire height of the room as also being uh, uh, disclosed on the facade, right? Um, so I'm just curious to, to what degree, right? Um, you have to abide by your own rules, right? And to what degree you start to disgrace them, right? I still think though that 
it's neither or, or this is the right one and this is the, the incorrect one. Um, but it, it could be interesting to know and to have more clarity about, you know, the method, right? Uh, the, the, the tools and the strategies that you deploy to achieve what we're seeing here, right? So um, if the excavation is uh, one tool, then there is another tool that you're also using um, to create like uh, the, the windows, right? But going back to uh, one of, if, if you can go back to uh, the, the photos of the sectional uh, model. Uh, yeah, here. I mean, there's a lot of things that I find extremely interesting about the quality uh, of the interior spaces. And when my favorite though uh, would be this one, uh, or maybe I think it's more clear in the plants. I don't know if here there's a problem of scale, uh, but it seemed to me that when I'm studying, you know, the height of the window is at the height of a person sitting and not to the person standing. I don't know if, if that is true, if, if I'm reading to it, or maybe, you know, there is a sort of um, uh, dissonance between the drawings and the model. But in, in, in the drawings, it seemed like you had the, the little bench and you had, you know, like a person standing here and then the view of that person standing here aligned uh, with the window, right? So I thought that th those were interesting conditions, interesting moments of introspection uh, that are extremely nice, right? Like I was thinking, oh, I would love to study there. Like I'm here on my computer and then I'm like, oh, okay, I can see in front of me, you know, uh, the view that it's presented or that it's framed by, by that window. And I think like something similar happens over here um, in which, you know, we have like the super compressed little space, right? That probably one person, you know, depending on how tall you are, you would have to, you know, um, uh, crawl almost. But then when you get here underneath here, the fact that there is this little gap that I was like concerned about at the beginning, I was like, oh, what is that? Uh, but then I thought it could be interesting. Like if you had a strategy to create slivers, and those slivers are, you know, highly curated moments to produce highly curated effects. Then I would have had, you know, also a sliver over here, right? As a means of introducing light, right? To this uh, very compressed space, right? And the reason we notice that it's such a, a weird little space is not just because of how it forces us to go through it, but also because here there is like a flood of light coming in. Right, so um, that's what I what I was claiming. You know, you do have two tools. One is the subtractive strategy, the one in which you subtract the entire mass of this, you know, uh, uh, perfect um, geometries. And then the other one is the strategy of the sliver. Right, when you want to curate very specific conditions, right, um, that relate to how you introduce light, how you introduce views how you introduce, let's say, um, natural ventilation, et cetera, right? So I think like uh, those two strategies needs, uh, need to be flushed out, need to be, you know, uh, very deliberately uh, claimed, right? And to understand like the rationale behind them. Um, I also like the, the sort of, um, as I was mentioning before, it, it's interesting how uh, the representation of the model helps create, you know, an appearance of something as if the project was emerging from the ground. But then when we see at the sections, we reveal, uh, you reveal to us that this is actually not true, <laughs> right? That there is a sort of precarious um, sort of balance between you know, the mass of the building and you know, uh, the little supports we have over here, they're in the center, but still like they read it as being precariously hold uh, and then, you know, the, these two columns over here that, uh, that seem to imply like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to maintain a balance, right? So I, I do like how then uh, as an exterior condition as well, the project is able to create like different perceptions of itself, right? Or different representations of, of itself. When we are on the front, we see like this almost monolithic uh, facade, right? And then uh, when we look to the sides, we see almost this precarious building that actually is not attached to the ground, right? So those are characteristics that, that I would love for you to, you know, claim even more or to actually, you know, 
really consider them as the tools that you're deploying as a designer. Okay. So Jeremy, I think we, you know, run out of time. Um, so sorry about okay. that. Thank you for the commentary. Right. Yeah, no, but thanks, Jeremy. It's a very nice project. Okay, I'm next. <laughs> Let me share my screen real quick. Oops. Can everyone see this? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Carmen. Uh, thank you for sticking with me to the end. I'm the last presenter. Um, uh, anyways, so I focused on uh, studying stream of consciousness, uh, like mainly. Um, and my design, in my design, I wanted to accommodate the research and practice of stream of consciousness writing and studying. Um, but also I wanted to translate that idea into the design itself. Um, uh, so just to kind of get us in the mindset, I wanted to say that James Joyce coined the theme or the idea of stream of consciousness, but also it was used by Virginia Woolf and a lot of modernist writers like Ernest Hemingway and Gertrude Stein. And also we've seen a lot of stream of consciousness ideas in um, more modern indie films lately, I would say, as they're very like focused on one character and you just see their mindset. Um, so I just wanna explain this little picture right here. So this is one of my entrances to the buildings, to the building. Um, and I wanted to really highlight my stairs and my circulation because I'll explain later, but they're a pretty significant part of my design. Um, so here are my drawings. Um, another goal in my design was to make the exterior, make the inside um, pretty apparent from the exterior design. So as you can see here, the spaces, I wouldn't call them rooms, I, it's just a space, um, but uh, they're pretty obvious from the outside and you'll see that in the pictures of my model as well. Um, so my, this is my um, ground floor or bottom floor. Um, and there's an entrance here. And then this is the top floor. And there's another entrance um, pretty much right above where this entrance is, but offset a little bit. Um, it's kind of hard to tell from these pictures, but my top and bottom floor are pretty much the same layout, but I shifted the second floor four feet to the right or to the north um, or yeah <laughs> so you'll be able to see that better in the pictures um, and then this is a section that is looking south and then this is a section that's looking north so another thing that i wanted to explore in my design was having a lot of nooks and different spaces to work in since stream of consciousness is a very um, like interior uh, process, internal process. Um, so you can see here, I have a lot of nooks here and here, and then this side and this side when they match together, um, they're the more open spaces, but I have a series of um, extrusions and intrusions Sorry, Siri just went off. Um, <laughs> uh, so I have a series of extrusions and intrusions that you'll see better in the next picture um, that create kind of a winding path through the building and you have to kind of go around one wall to get to a different space. Um, so here is an image of my exterior. Um, this is the west facade and I would say this is one of the most important facades um, in my building, since this is how you get up to the spaces. So um, in my design, I wanted to show the complexity of stream of consciousness through the circulation. So when you think, sometimes it's very streamlined, but you have to like go around thoughts and sometimes 
it, so stream of consciousness is mainly focused on the present tense, but it's kind of inevitable to look to the past and or to the future. So my idea was to have this kind of very processional way to get to the top, or you could just stop um, and go to this floor. Um, but then you walk through this space and there's a balcony over here. But in order to get to the bottom floor, you have to go back from where you came from. So I kind of wanted um, my design to show stream of consciousness um, moving forward as moving present or moving to the future and then moving back in order to move forward in a way that's very complex. <laughs> um, here I have uh, my, this is the south elevation um, and this is the balcony. So the top of the first floor, the roof of the top, or sorry, the roof of the first floor serves as the balcony um, of the second floor. And then, um, yeah, you can see that um, an isometric view here. And another part of the circulation in my site and in my building. So this is where you enter the building, but also as you come down, there's kind of a natural flow into this ramp down and into the pit that's behind the building right here. Um, and that'll be the cooking space. And again, I just wanted to um, use procession and circulation as a very influential part of my design and have a lot of motion and fluidity and in a way repetition because you have to follow the same path um, to get to various different spaces. And then finally, this is um, kind of a snapshot of everything. So this is the south facade. This is the north facade. Um, there's not many fenestrations here because I imagined the forest to be behind um, this facade. This is my top view. Uh, this is the west elevation. No, sorry, this is the east elevation. This is the west elevation. Um, and then this is kind of a, a shot from the bottom because I think it shows how I pushed space in and then out in different spaces. Um, and I wanted to show that kind of like positive, negative, uh, very stereotomic relationship in the way I designed my building. You're muted, sorry. <laughs> um, sorry, well, thank you, Carmen. Um, so I had a question though, you mentioned a winding path. Which one exactly is your winding path? Um, so just kind of the idea that you have to walk through and then you make a left turn and a left turn to go up here, then another left and a left and then up and then you turn right. And then you have to walk through this space to get through the, to the balcony to the end. Mm -hmm. And then you have to come back, um, and take this same staircase to get to the, to the different spaces. Um, so in a way it's a circular, but very kind of um, broken up way of pr proceeding through space and um, yeah. Yeah, so the reason why I'm asking this though is that there seems to be like a, a winding or as you mentioned, like a pushing in and out of certain volumes in regards to others, right? Some are mm -hmm. silent, some are void, some, want, uh, some of them push in, some of them push out, right? Um, and, and I like it as an overall strategy. I think like it is uh, uh, successful at certain moments. Like I agree with you, this image here, like bottom up, um, uh, almost like a worm's eye view, right, of, of the building. Well, it wouldn't be a worm's eye view, but almost. Um, you know, uh, says a lot about that condition, right? And like even the little figurine here as you know, almost being in this precarious space, uh, reinforcing the, the, 
you know, this cantilever over here, right? Um, but then when it comes to, you know, seriously understanding and really, uh, you know, going all in with, uh, with your strategies, I don't think that the stair actually does uh, that winding uh, condition or windingness <laughs> that you claim it's doing, right? And I think like a way of actually achieving that is to this uh, thread over here, push it to this other side, right? Mm -hmm. So that actually when we reach this floor over here, we just have to go through this entire floor to actually uh, reach the stair here on the side to go to the next level, right? And in that way, you're actually indeed winding throughout, uh, you know, the longitudinal section of the project, right? And seriously, you know, uh, allowing for this uh, divergent paths to mingle together uh, on that floor, right? And that also comes from a recognition that a landing, you know, uh, here, if, if this is like a, 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 an in-between landing, the landings of floors can already be the floor plate of that floor, right? Um, so in a way, you know, you could have extended this one over here and then, you know, create also one of those precarious balconies um, and things like that, right? Like um, to actually understand that the, the windingness quality that you're trying to achieve, it's also exacerbated not just by one element, but all different elements working as a whole, right? So the floor plates working uh, and collaborating with the stairs, right? And with the balconies, et cetera, right? So I think like it is, you know, reflecting on that, um, you know, uh, almost teamwork that architectural elements sometimes are doing and playing with one another, right? In what ways does a floor plan reinforces, you know, uh, certain conditions regarding circulation that are not obvious. They're just obvious when you place a stair, right? in its opposite direction, right? Um, and in that way, you're able to create diagonals. You're able to create, you know, uh, almost circuitous uh, pathways, right? That might indeed engage with the building uh, even more so than, uh, than what you have right now, right? Because, you know, if, if, if I were like not a curious person, you know, like I would just go up, look around and then come back, right? there wouldn't be like a reason for me to stay. But if, you know, if this side of the stair wasn't here and it was indeed over here, right? I don't know in what ways that would work, but maybe it does something like this and we arrive over here probably, right? We're really indeed forced to go around, right? And to actually encounter all of the interesting spaces that you have provided, right? But anyways, you didn't do that, right? Um, and, and the reason why I'm just suggesting this now is because it would absolutely and, and truly enhance all of the qualities that you're seriously, and because of how you uh, presented the project, how seriously you thought about that, right? How you thought about, you know, also the issue of the stream of consciousness is also an issue of representation, right? Like there have been, you know, um, male writers that, you know, coined the term, but there have been many others also female and male that have also used the term, right? So um, in that way, right, then there is not a one-sidedness to the story, right? There's not a one-sidedness to, um, to the concept. So that's why I think like, if you think about dualities and in what ways, you know, a stare can become that, like the instrument that allows you to have those dualities um, becomes extremely helpful, right? For example, like this, uh, this facade, right, is like almost, uh, the, the, the one that is most excavated, this one seems to be more, uh, less porous, right? But that's why it's so convincing, this idea of a winding path that unites them both, right? So when you have the stair, um, uh, where would it be? Like the stair going up here, there is a landing here and then going over there. You could see like the same condition that is happening here, but with a very opaque facade versus one that it's more porous, right? more intricate. So um, anyways, I think though that the project is very successful. I, I really do like, you know, this little sliver over here to reach this one thing, right? Because why having a direct path when you can get lost or at least wander around, right? Uh, and then that is actually for me like the most successful manifestation of the concept, right? 
like even though there is a goal right we just have to follow the path we can still wander through that path uh, path right we can still look up we can you know go back if we get tired we can just sit around right um, something similar should then also happen over here but anyways, I, I do think that, uh, you know, overall the project is extremely interesting, especially, you know, looking at this condition over here. I, I, I agree with you that you know, the project would have been, you know, another thing if we didn't have this view. So I, you know, I congratulate about the fact of recognizing also like the interesting spatial conditions that, uh, that the project was able to do and, you know, to recognize that through a photograph. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Carmen. And thank you, everyone. I don't know if we still have time. Do we have time? Okay. No, it's already 104. I think we have to go back to the. Maybe, okay. The Sounds, but before I leave you, though, and since we're all here, like, seriously, congratulations. Like, you have done like a better job at this, you know, uh, design principles. Uh, thing than I did when I was a, a student. So seriously, congratulations. You should be, you know, very proud. All right, let's go. Bye.